those who defend the easy accessibility of assault weapons should meet these families and explain why that makes sense. President Obama renews his call for a ban on assault weapons. We'll hear the pros and cons. And I'll have some time with my family, and then uh, if there's been a change in, in our status, I'll be sure to invite everyone. Well, you can kind of hear that. Marco Rubio mulling over a rerun for the Senate, just what he said he would not do for more than a year. So what's changed? We'll take it to the roundtable. I would be delighted to, to, to see Marco Rubio run for election. Senate candidate Alan Grayson says he can beat Marco Rubio. First, of course, he's got to win the Democratic Senate primary. Grayson's quite a character here for yourself. Good morning and thank you so much for spending some of your Father's Day with us. Happy Father's Day to you and all the fathers out there. The end of a week of mm. profound pain and so many questions. And most of the pain, of course, was felt in Orlando at a gay nightclub called Pulse, where 49 people were shot to death, 53 more were wounded, many gravely. The weapon of choice in that attack at the Pulse nightclub, as in previous mass casualty shootings, was an assault rifle. This time, specifically, a Sig Sauer MCX, a civilian version of the military M16 rifle. Gunman Omar Mateen also had a Glock 17 pistol. Both weapons were purchased legally, even though Mateen had twice been interviewed by the FBI and had been placed for a while on the terror watch list. And so we begin today focused on weapons and access to them. Senator Dwight Bullard is among the Florida lawmakers calling for a special legislative session to consider tougher gun control laws. Senator Bullard is a Democrat from Southwest Miami-Dade. And joining us via satellite this morning from Tallahassee, Barney Bishop, an influential voice in the state capitol as immediate past president and CEO of Associated Industries of Florida. And right now he is a consultant and a speaker. And on Friday, he published a column entitled, Banning Guns Won't Solve Our Problems. Good morning, Mr. Bishop, Senator Bullard. Great to have you with us. Good morning to you both. We are glad to have this conversation, as painful as it is. Uh, Senator Bullard, first, what new legislation affecting gun sales is needed in Florida, and why is it needed? Well, uh, beyond the, the scope of gun sales, of course, we, we have to look at this from a holistic standpoint. But speaking to gun sales specifically, uh, the closing of the gun show loophole is absolutely necessary. The closing of the online loophole. Uh, but what the Senate Democrats are going to be calling for this upcoming week is really looking at those folks on the terrorist watch list and banning them from uh, getting weapons or acquiring weapons. Of course, needless to say, Omar Martin had been on the watch list, but mm -hmm. he had been taken off. And legally, he had, he had every right to buy a gun. Uh, does rightfully, that bother you? Rightfully so, and that, it does bother me. But uh, as the uh, Senate Democrats, the U.S. Senate Democrats are trying to push for uh, looking, uh, allowing the FBI to then look into someone who's already been interviewed and potentially putting them back on the list or rejecting the sale of that weapon is what we're pursuing. Those, those are the two big things on the table that actually this week have gotten some broader support. Uh, Mr. Bishop in Tallahassee, thanks for being with us this morning on Father's Day. You're listening. Is, is there on this day an issue with those two things that the Senate is looking into from your perspective? Absolutely, because it's not going to solve the problem. First off, there's millions of weapons out there. And when we banned assault weapons before, there was only mixed results. So it's not going to solve the problem. The problem is really mental health. But I think that Democrats, and I am a conservative Democrat in North Florida, believe that really that's the issue that we need to address is mental health, not trying to take away people's guns. There's a reason why it's called the Second Amendment. There's only one amendment that trumps it, and that is freedom of speech. So guns are a part of American history, and assault weapons are there for defensive purposes. Anybody can use any weapon to kill people. Uh, yeah. Can we just follow up on that for one moment? Sure. The, there, uh, the assault weapons ban that ended in 2004, uh, th that is one of the things that actually President Reagan was supportive of, the ban on assault weapons. But the Second Amendment and assault weapons is, is one of those things that have been debated. Does the right to bear arms also include things like rocket-propelled grenades or Sherman tanks, I mean, assault weapons, and I guess we can talk more about this as the segment goes on, but assault weapons, 
right now there is a broad coalition of bipartisan support to really review whether assault weapons that can kill many people with one clip uh, in one shot are really appropriate. Well, the, the broadband coalition that you're talking about are all to the far left. That's not where the, the people of Florida are in the centrist section or on the far right. Florida's got more concealed gun permits than any other state in the country. And so that's just a fallacious thought. It's true down in South Florida, but it's not true in Central Florida. It's not true in North Florida. The, what is needs to be addressed is the mental health issue. And I think scoring, trying to score political points by saying that you're gonna ban assault weapons, which didn't work before, it's not gonna work this time, is missing the point. We need to be talking about mental health because all of these people have got serious mental health issues. All right, well, Senator Bullard, mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you to respond to the point that Barney Bishop just made. Uh, in the last session of the legislature, you and your fellow legislators did uh, pass something called No Wrong Door, which is really fairly revolutionary. Uh, it does provide better mental health services to the people of Florida, but I don't know that uh, Omar Mateen ever uh, would have gone through that door. I mean, right, and, and, and let's be clear. I agree with the need for more mental health services. I agree uh, that uh, we can do a better job with 21st century policing and, and the like, but it should not be an either or uh, mm -hmm. question. It is a and everything else. And uh, unfortunately, we always sort of mire this down as if gun control should not be talked about. We're talking about guns that kill people. And people like to shift it to talking about things like uh, terrorism and try to give it a spin as if it has to do with one region of the world. The reality is most of the mass shootings, including places like uh, Pearl, Mississippi, Columbine in Colorado, Aurora, uh, Oregon uh, this past October, were all committed by people who were not of the Muslim faith. So we're going to talk about the notion of terrorism and who these folks are. Yeah. We have to talk about gun control in a very responsible way. Well, Newtown, Connecticut also, you can put on that Absolutely. list. And in several of those instances, at least three or four of them, the gun of choice of the shooter was an assault-style weapon. AR-15 is sort of the generic uh, name of the weapon. Agreed, and it's unfortunate that the NRA and its Florida affiliates want to... Uh, uh, make it seem as though the AR-15 is a sporting rifle. The idea of a sporting rifle, I recently saw an interview with the person who invented the M16 or the AR-15 mm -hmm. model that we have that said it was supposed to be meant as a weapon of war because when the bullet leaves the chamber of the gun, it spins through whatever it hits, destroying all the internal yeah. mechanisms of, of that body. <laughs> Barney Bishop, um, your column that you wrote, um, really made a, a very good case for focusing on mental health in this debate. And it also, I want to quote a couple of things that you said, turn these tragedies into a debate about guns by a mainstream media and Democrats. You also said um, these people want to leave all helpless and armed and only criminals and terrorists would have guns. And um, while there is a lot of people who would agree with you and a lot of people in the mainstream media and Democrats who would like to see gun safety and rights protected. What What is it about this to you that has become so political? And why can't this be couched as, as gun safety instead of gun control? Why is this a political issue? Well, it's a political issue because my good friend, Senator Bullard and other Democrats make it a political issue. Look, he talks about spin. There's no more spin than just what he was saying himself. Chicago's got some of the toughest gun rights gun control legislation in the entire country, and it's the number one murder capital of the world. Look, it's terrible when people get killed through massacres, but it's just as bad when the president encourages people to disrespect law enforcement and police officers in New York City and in other cities get assassinated. We should be as concerned about that. It doesn't matter how many bullets is in a gun. It does, it, what matters is the fact that people are dying. And they're going to die whether it's one bullet or whether it's ten bullets. But the truth of the fact is gun control hasn't worked anywhere in this country. And it's not about gun safety because, frankly, I own a number of guns. I've never created a problem. All of the people in Florida that got a concealed gun permit, they're not causing the problem. Except it's for people Omar Mateen. That have either got a had, mental health ex, issue. Excuse me, except for Omar Mateen, who had a concealed weapons license and, and caused the and, problem. And I would like to just push well, back. Well, and that's fine because he was in. He was in the security business, but supposedly his superiors were told at G4S that he had some issues. Now, whether that in fact is true or not, it doesn't matter. 
that he's the only concealed weapon permit person that's already had, that's ever had a problem in Florida. And again, that's because he was employed. Most of us are not employed in that business. We simply want a weapon to defend ourselves. And people that own guns are responsible people. This is the first time ever that a concealed gun permit person has killed someone. And again, that's because he was employed in that uh, industry. Again, I want to push back. I, I agree wholeheartedly with, you, with, with Barney when he refers to the notion of we need to look at Chicago, gun violence in Liberty City, uh, as well as Miami Gardens here locally. The reality is it's easier to acquire a handgun in this country than it is a laptop computer. And oftentimes the shooters are of school age. So when we think about gun issues, the issues of gun safety, I would love for the NRA, the Sportsman's Association, anyone else to give me some feedback on how we address the issues of critical uh, and salacious gun violence around the country. All right, well, if we could, I want to put for you respond, well, the, Barney. Hold, hold on just a second. Let me put up a line from a Washington sure. Post editorial that was published this week that sort of addresses your point, Senator Bullitt. If we can put this up on the screen, the Post editorialized, headline grabbing mass shootings remind us of how good guns are at killing people. Change. Uh, they also remind us, or should, that a rational government would regulate such dangerous products just as it regulates cars, pharmaceuticals, and other more useful things. So the idea of, of regulating guns and the people who buy them is a perfectly, I, I think, reasonable approach to this. The reality is that weapons of well, destruction, I, uh, guns, cars, or anything else, it's funny, you, you, you drive a 2,000 pound vehicle and you're required to carry liability insurance, but someone can acquire something at a Kmart or a Walmart, walk out of the store in 40 minutes and, and shoot somebody and of course, feel no repercussions outside of uh, the prison system, and that's if they're caught. Barney, you were going to respond. Let's give you the last word here. Please do. Sure, sure. Well, I'm not surprised that you would use a quote from the Washington Post. That's part of the mainstream media and the Democrats that I was talking about to begin with. If you told me that that came out of the Wall Street Journal, I might be more impressed. But the reality of the fact is, is that just a British politician was just killed. She was shot but then she was killed with a knife. So the problem is, it goes back to mental health. This isn't about gun control. And the NRA and all of us that own guns have no problems with the registration process and a waiting period. The truth of the matter is the people that do this have got two problems. Either they are, have a mental health issue, which we're not addressing at the level that we need to, or number two, they've got hate. And I don't know how you can regulate hate, but to the extent that we give law enforcement the resources necessary to investigate these people and then keep them on whatever kind of a list that's appropriate is the right way to go. Not ban All right, guns Barney. or not to ban assault weapons. All right, Barney, Barney Bishop in Tallahassee. Barney, thank you for joining us on the Sunday morning. Senator, Senator Dwight Bullard, we appreciate you. you coming in as well. This is a debate that will go on Certainly, it's been going on for years. It's going to continue. And right here as well. And up next, Congressman Alan Grayson of Orlando. This week, he said it's too easy to kill someone. Grayson is a Democrat locked in a tight race for the U.S. Senate, not one to hold back. And you will hear him not hold back next. For the past year, it looked like Senator Marco Rubio's seat would be up for grabs this November, while he's now signaling a possible run for re-election, upending the Republican primary. He is mulling that over this very weekend. Meanwhile, over in the Democratic primary, there are two candidates, and this week, I sat down with one of them, Congressman Ellen Grayson. And we are joined now by Congressman Ellen Grayson. Uh, member of Congress from the 9th Congressional District of Florida, the Orlando or, uh, area. Congressman, welcome. Glad Thanks. to have you come in. Thanks for having me. Let's begin with this tragedy in Orlando this week. Governor Rick Scott said, quote, the Second Amendment didn't kill these people. Evil killed these people. Of course, the evil person had a, uh, an assault-style weapon. Should they be banned again? Yes, absolutely. No question about it. What actually happened is that one person using one weapon killed almost 50 people in a matter of minutes. He couldn't have done that with a box cutter or even a pistol. It took an assault weapon to kill that many people so quickly. There's a frightening video available online of the actual shooting. If you count the shots, you'll hear 17 shots in five seconds. It's well, just too easy to kill yeah. too many people too quickly. Right, well, he, he had a semi-automatic version of a military weapon. 
he had a Sig Sauer MCX, which in Florida, you, there's no waiting period. You go in, you fill out the forms. If you're not a criminal and you pass uh, a minimal background check and you are a resident of the state of Florida, can prove who you are, you get the gun. Is that the way it should be? That's right. Look, we just lived through the largest, the worst mass shooting in the history of America. Why? It wasn't because this person had any special skills or abilities. It's because he had a weapon that could kill so many people so quickly. That's why it was what it was. Yeah. Well, your Republican opponents, those who want the Republican Senate nomination, say this isn't uh, really about weapons. That's going to be a, a dead-end kind of conversation. It should be about fighting terrorism. And they say, President Obama, the Congress doesn't really have a viable program to fight terrorism. Well, we don't have a viable program to fight ideas, even if they're malevolent, evil ideas. As the President pointed out, no matter how high you build the wall, it won't keep out the Internet. This is someone who, as far as we can tell at this point, was acting on extremist Muslim hateful ideology. Right. Also but he was a acting, homophobe, too. Yes, apparently. that's right. That's right. But he was acting pretty much alone. It's not that some organization had him as a member. Right. It's, it's not as if somebody gave him instructions. It's not as if he was some part of some terror cell. Right. And he was what the police called a lone wolf. Yeah. And that's not something that can be easily fought. Uh, Congress, uh, even as we speak, and the Senate, they are considering a bill that we could summarize with the term no fly, no buy. If you are on the, the no fly witch, uh, no fly list for terrorist suspected terrorism, you shouldn't be able to buy a gun in the United States. Do you support that? I do. Uh, in fact, one of the things that became clear right afterward is the fact that although the FBI had spoken to the attacker three times, once he was off the, the, the list, the, the terror list, which is not the same as the no-fly list, but I don't want to right. get into those levels of nuances. Once he was off that list, he was receiving no further scrutiny. So we actually have two related problems. One is that if you're on the no-fly list, you can still purchase a gun. You can right. buy. That's one problem. The other problem is that once you're off the list, you don't receive any further scrutiny. Now, Senator Nelson introduced a bill that I've been calling for since the day after this tragedy to, cl to eliminate that loophole as well and make sure that if you've been on the list, if you've been scrutinized and use something like buy an assault rifle, you get back under the scrutiny and they look at you further. Right. Uh, Congressman, uh, in April, as you will know, the Office of Congressional Ethics released this 74-page report that essentially said they had reason to believe that you improperly ran a hedge fund, then based in the Cayman Islands, while you were a member of Congress, and that was an ethical breach. Did you break the House ethics rules? No, and that's not what they said. They said that I might have, which is a far thing from that I did. Now, in this country, we're all innocent until proven guilty. I sit here, I look you in the eye, and I'll tell you honestly, I didn't do it. All right? What's happening right now is an attack, a smear campaign by my political opponents. I will tell you, this is the silly season. All right? This is where we are. Hillary Clinton did not kill Vince Foster. She did not have a lesbian relationship with Janet Reno. Well, there are all kinds of uh, silly this, things out exactly. there. Exactly. And, and that's you, what I'm you suffering You put this here. in that same category? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, Harry Reid didn't put it in that category. The Senate minority said, a leader said he was deeply troubled by the allegations and they should disqualify you from a seat in the Senate. Quote, his actions aren't just disgraceful to the Democratic Party. They disgrace the halls of Congress. Well, I mean, look, it's politics. Okay, that's the way it is. It's a very rough game that's being played against me right now. They're trying to force me out of the race because I'm winning. Because people know that I'm a congressman with guts. I'd be a senator with guts. I've passed more amendments than any other member of Congress. 26 grace and bills are now passed by the House, passed by the Senate, signed into law by the President. Mm -hmm. That's not what they want. Our leaders, both Republican and Democratic, want callow tools in office. They want well, people who are Patrick, obedient to them. Is Patrick Murphy, who has been endorsed by the president, the vice president, they've both been in Florida to raise money for him, is he a callow tool? Yes, he is. Why? Because he does whatever he's told by the big shots. The bosses boss him around. He does whatever the lobbyists want, whatever the leadership wants, and basically he gets nothing done. You know, I've been selected as the most effective member of Congress by Slate magazine. A different organization named him the least effective member of Congress. And sadly, that's what the political bosses want. They want somebody who's a yes man. I'm not a yes man. Well, you are not, and you are famously known as somebody who is willing to stand up on the floor of the House or elsewhere, maybe here on Channel 10, and say some 
fairly outrageous things. I no, guess. not outrageous, just honest. You know, we've reached the point now where well, honest is considered to be outrageous. All right, well, 2000, uh, Congressman, 2009, I think the first time you came to my attention and to a lot of people's attention is when you said the Republican health care plan is for, quote, sick people to die quickly. Uh, I mean, that, that's not something you normally hear a congressman say. But it's true. What is the Republican health care plan for the 40 million people who don't have health coverage? What is their plan? You tell me. Well, they say they have one. I'm not here prepared no, to give actually, you what it is. I'll be, I've been in Congress now since 2008. I'll tell you, they have no plan. I was, I was engaging in satire, if you will, to point out the hard, cold fact that there are 40,000 Americans who die every year because they have no health insurance, and the Republicans, God bless them, they have no plan. Their plan for those people is don't get sick, and if you do get sick, die quickly. If that's outrageous, it's the truth. All right. Congressman Ellen Grayson, what is the theme of your campaign? I don't mean to say reductio ad absurdum, but, I mean, people are watching this and they're saying, well, what's this campaign all about? What is your campaign? Very simple. Seniors deserve a raise. Do you know how long it's been since we've increased Social Security benefits? Yeah. Any idea? Forty I years. It's been 40 years well, since seniors got raised. Well, there's a cost of living allowance. The COLA goes up. I we didn't know. have one this year. And I was so concerned about that that I asked the Congressional Research Service, what should we do? Is that correct, that the cost of living adjustment should be zero? They came back to me and they told me it should be 2.9%. So I introduced the Seniors as Ever Raise Act to give seniors the, the increase they should have gotten and also introduced the Seniors Have Eyes, Ears, and Teeth Act to have Medicare cover eyes, ears, and yeah. teeth. Well, where's it's the money going to come? Where's the money going to come from if seniors and I'm a somebody who qualifies for Medicare and uh, and for Social Security? Where's that money going to come from? We don't even give seniors preventative care. There are 2.8 million blind seniors in this country. So many of them would be able to see today if Medicare could have reimbursed a $40 eye test that they're forbidden by law from reimbursing. We're not giving people preventative care that ends up being penny wise and pound foolish. Well, those are policies for another day. But finally, let me just say, Representative David Jolly dropped out on the Democratic side. Marco Rubio says he's going to reconsider running. You're in this. Qualifying ends next Friday, the 24th. You're in it to stay? Of course. Look, I would be delighted to, to, to see Marco Rubio run for election. I've passed 26 bills in the last three years, many of whom have helped seniors, okay? Veterans, seniors, young people, people who are about to lose their home. Uh, people who have no health coverage. Can you name the only bill that Marco Rubio has passed in five years in the Senate? Any idea? Well, I can't name it. I know that he has been a, a voice on foreign policy and some other issues, but I don't know what his legislative record is. The only bill that he's passed in five years is a bill to rename September Spinal Cord Injury Month. All right. Well, we can check that, but in any event, <laughs> I'm... <laughs> Alan Grayson, thank you for coming in. We will follow your campaign closely. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. All right, stay with us when we come back. It is time for the roundtable. Like we've already gotten started, but there is so much to take to the roundtable. So much to talk about this week. Is there ever? So let's get right to the introductions. What a roundtable we've got for you. There is Steve Vasquez. He is the Tallahassee Bureau Chief for the Combined Tampa Bay Times, Miami Herald Bureau, and he has covered Florida government and politics for oh so many years. And a long time ago, he was a reporter here at Channel 10. Steve, welcome. Thanks very welcome. much. Welcome. Mark Caputo is the Florida correspondent for Politico and writes the Political Flo Politico Florida Playbook, the go-to <laughs> guide on Florida politics. And Marley Cancio is an attorney in her own named firm and an activist in Republican Party politics here. We are glad to welcome her back. Welcome, everybody. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Fathers. I guess we can't say Happy Father's Day back to you. Uh, well, I'll it's take not like it. Merry Christmas. Well, we'll take it. Happy Father's Day to my dad that is watching. He's a huge Mine fan too. of the show. Hey, Marty. And your father <laughs> is, I'm a fan of his. Pepe oh, Cancio is a wonderful man. Uh, let's begin with this terrible tragedy, the massacre in Orlando, and Steve Vasquez. Um, I happen to think that uh, uh, some of our elected leaders uh, did a very good job up there. Mayor Buddy Dyer of Orlando, I thought, showed steadiness and strength and was not self-aggrandizing. Right. There were some people who stepped up to the mic and I thought were there to sort of aggrandize themselves in a tragic situation. 
but overall, I thought uh, it was good. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, you, there's no way to prepare for this, uh, and and it's a, just a horrific thing. And Buddy Dyer uh, really was a voice for unity and for healing in the community. Um, you know. Rick Scott, the governor of the state, um, uh, showed empathy and went around and met with first responders. But we all know, you know, this is not Rick Scott's strong suit in terms of being a yeah. consoler, especially yeah, but in the public. He, but he did, he did stay uh, throughout the week. He has been to every memorial service. He's attended the funeral services. I'm, you got to give him this, that this is not his natural constituency. But right. I think he has shown a real empathy which is not one of his strong suits. But well, showing leadership, this is what you're supposed to do in these situations. Yeah. yeah. He did. I, I agree. I think every he day he, he was out with, you know, it wasn't warm and fuzzy, but every day he was out with a list of what the state's response was going to do. But I, I guess the question is, you had the president, the vice president, the governor, the senators, the representatives, and there are people who are saying, oh, they're politicizing this event. Mm -hmm. how, how do you not have your elected officials out there? No, exactly. Well, I mean, there was an elected official from Orlando that she got the mic and then she started speaking about, you know, gun violence the day of, and I, I thought that was so out of form. That's State Politicized. Senator Geraldine Thompson. She's right. running for the congressional seat there. But I, one of the reasons you did hear criticisms is that, by and large, the LGBT community is Democrat leaning or mm -hmm. liberal leaning. And many of these politicians on stage are Republican conservatives who opposed many issues important to the LGBT community. Gay marriage, gay adoption, and things of that nature, and these human rights yeah. ordinances. And so therefore, people, one of the reasons you heard them saying they're politicizing it, they're saying, look, you never come to events that affect gays until now, and then you don't but, even but mention But this wasn't gays. about gays. This was about an attack on America. This was an Tell attack. Tell that to 100 gay people no. got shot. No, they, they, they were not 100. Were right. The, one was a mother of 11 mm -hmm. kids that was there with her son. This was not the, an attack the overwhelming on... Majority but it was done in Pride, it was done in pride the, Month at a gay club. I mean, yeah. it, it had the a gay The overwhelming issue. majority of people who were shot and killed and or wounded were gay. I mean, that's just indisputable. Uh, and they and receive this, a lot this, of love from, from the entire community. But this the, is about they, all of us being the same, all of us being Americans. And I yeah. felt under attack when this happened. This happened a week ago, right. you know, right when this show was going on air and a lot of you yes. went over there. This was an attack on all of us. And this is an attack by a crazy person that also is an Islamic terrorist. Then we don't hear about that other half of it. We hear, mm -hmm. this is awful, this is gays, this is guns, and we don't talk about I think we the other component. Hearing, I we're think hearing we've about, heard a lot about And there are questions, either or or both. And I think whether the FBI, uh, special well, agent, Glenna, and special Glenna agent spent the that. entire week up in Fort Pierce and St. Lucie County and speaking to the father repeatedly. And you brought to, I think, to the fore the fact that... Uh, that, that guy's a weirdo. That this, that, well, the father is a strange I'm dude. I'm sorry to say I, that. I, yeah, I, he I, is. I will tell you, in, um, we spoke a lot, and he kept changing his message and his story, and I, I don't know whether he meant to change that to fit somebody's narrative or whether I think he's just as confused as everyone else. That was my impression. And you're furrowing your brow because... Well... Uh, you know, let's hold the shooter responsible for the shooting. But if you did listen to his various comments, yeah, he was all over the map. In the end, this guy did have mental health issues. In the end... Oh, Omar, you're talking about... Correct. It does sound like he was a self-hating gay person. We're not sure because it's after the fact. And in the end, he was an Islamic terrorist. It's all three. And right. I don't think you could it's separate complicated. them. It's complicated, yeah. It, so, it Steve, the, the question then becomes, there are all of these checks and balances, Omar, Mateen didn't get checked or balanced by any one of them in the end. No, it, 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 the, it reads like there was red flag after red flag after red flag, but, and of course he was on that terrorist watch list for a while. Uh, we find out now that the person who is, who's uh, performed the, the psychological examination, Carol Noodleman, mm -hmm. uh, she didn't. She, she didn't. Says. She didn't. Yeah. She said that it was, uh, uh, there, there are still holes and gaps in this whole thing. We need to know more about how security guards get licensed in this state and what kind of mental health screening that they're putting these folks through. I think Steve raises a great point. I want to expand on it. Yes, it's true that Mayor Buddy Dyer did a great job, but the city of Orlando is complicit right now in what looks like a cover-up. They're not releasing the 911 tapes. The 911 tapes will help us piece together what happened. Mm -hmm. Speaking of protocols, we need to know if there are proper police protocols going forward so the next time this happens, it doesn't happen at the scale. I, I, I can, may I tell you, I have been privy to internal memos, and, and one of the biggest 
sort of fears of the press corps there, and I, I say this very generally, that it was too soon to go there. It's too soon to look for criticisms and questions. That's insane. But I will tell you that there are questions right now that But you've been, you've been criticizing the three hours. I know you kept posting, three hours, three hours. Why, what happened? why nothing happened in three hours? And From they put a pretty detail. 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. Right. right. I have, and here's what's interesting is now the Miami Herald did a great TikTok. Yes. And there is something called an active shooter response protocol, which was founded after Columbine, which says if there's an active shooter, you have to go in the building. At 2.15, 11 police officers showed up after shots were fired between Mateen and the initial police officer. And they didn't go in the building and execute the active shooter response protocol. There's a possibility that that was a mistake right there. They then went into a hostage protocol. Now the question is, in the future, if you've got someone who shoots a bunch of people, is that hostage protocol still adequate? Because if it is, well, what happened is I doubt this guy was able to have a 50% fatality rate on his shootings. And therefore, a lot of people bled to death who otherwise would have been able to be saved because they went into a hostage protocol and they didn't go in and people weren't safe. I mean, that's a valid question, right? They're, those are valid questions yeah, to ask. Yeah, they're valid questions, but I thought that the, the criticism was too soon. Uh, I, I do believe that police did a good job uh, trying to save and to rescue uh, some of the survivors. I think they, they showed it. And political correctness. Bravery. And they political co not, correctness is one of the reasons I think that this happened. Because a lot of co workers. How, how so? What, a lot what of co workers. The fact that he was a Muslim, and when some co workers complain about him, he, w he was not. Uh, no action was taken because he was a Muslim. The company the denies comp that happened, by the way. You know what? Let me. Can we take a quick break right now? Because I think we can explore this topic and we need to go to break for it. Stay with us. Two minutes. We'll be right back. We'll pick it up from right here. On this Sunday morning, we are in the midst of a rock and rolling roundtable uh, with uh, Mark Caputo from Politico, Steve Busquet from the Tampa Bay Times, Miami Herald Bureau in Tallahassee, and Miami Attorney Mara Lee Cancio. All right, political correctness. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't detect a lot of political correctness here. Unfortunately, where, 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 where do you, I do. Where do you see it? I see it everywhere. I see it when we. There's a whole article in the Miami Herald, and they talk about gun violence, but they don't want to talk about Islamic terrorism. When even mm -hmm. when Mark says maybe he was all three, but they leave the part about radical Islamic terrorism out of the equation, and I think that's political correctness. And we're going to be attacked more. This is well, not going to be the know. last time. May I say, I don't know, I, I've read all of the Miami Herald accounts, but I read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and I have seen lots of coverage dealing with Islamic, radical Islamic terrorism. There has, and it's been part of the discussion all the way through, I think, I agree. A, a little historical perspective here. There's been, and you've been in this community for such a long time, we've been debating access to guns and handguns in this state for going on now 40 years, back right. in the days when Senator Ron Silver got a three-day cooling off period right. on the ballot, and counties had their own gun control laws that the state, in effect, said, you can't do that anymore. The state mm -hmm. is going to set gun control uh, measures for the state, which is what the NRA wants. Can, right. I, yeah. can I say, I have heard law enforcement officers Hardy aside, echo what Mary Lee is talking about, that there is, and it's not about press, it's about this community, law enforcement officials say, there's, there's too much PC to talk about the real issue because it involves someone's culture and religion. So the question becomes, how do you talk about that without demonizing an entire culture or religion and the good people in it? Well, I think we're doing that now. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I fundamentally disagree with that. The, the, um, one of the first things that came out is this the guy was pledged allegiance to ISIS. Uh, what I do think is interesting, sorry to harp on my idea of a cover-up here, I do think it's interesting that the FBI has been complicit in holding the 911 tapes back, but then they selectively leak little strands of information that fit yeah. their narrative. It's going if to anyone is doing any spin, it's law enforcement, not the media. Yeah. It's going well, to crime, rate, crime rate is at an all-time low in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And the use of arms, it's really you know, not directly associated with these mass shootings. If you divide the number of citizens in, in this country, over yeah. 330 you million know, by the number. Mary Lee, so, you're right, but in Miami, in the last three years, 100 children and teens in black inner city neighborhoods have been shot and then 35 have been shot to death. And uh, I don't 
Mostly with handguns and illegal guns. You know, what the state guns. average is, the local average is unacceptable. I agree with you completely. And something needs to be done about and, and it. Well, Chicago, and Chicago, and Chicago. Why don't we talk about Chicago? Well, let's that, do talk that, about you know, Chicago. Chicago, they've had more, more people killed in Chicago mm -hmm. than in the war in Afghanistan since 2001. Mm -hmm. Just this weekend, well, 16 people were shot. And Chicago has the strictest gun laws in the country, and that does not keep bad people from getting guns. Is I that domestic that, terrorism? Do we sure. call that domestic yeah, terrorism? Yeah, that's terrorism. It is true. It is true that, that the overall crime rate in Florida has been going down. And that's something you hear Rick Scott talk about endlessly, that our crime rate is at a 45-year-old. One horrific rampage like we saw a week ago in Orlando uh, changes the whole public perception yeah. of that. And it's, it's also true that murder and sexual assault has gone up. So v violent crime is showing an increase in the state, but the overall crime rate's going down. Yeah, you know, something the governor said this week in an interview with the New York Times that just leaped out at me. He said the Second Amendment didn't kill those people. Evil killed those people. The governor, of course, doesn't think any additional legislation is needed. And, you know, to an extent he's right. No, it wasn't the Second Amendment. It was a Sig Sauer uh, assault rifle. No, it was, in the well, it was hands, a guy, it was in a guy the hands one of, yeah. of an insane right. or or mentally uh, disturbed person, you know, with a lot of hate in his heart. So homophobe. because of him, then all the law-abiding citizens are going to lose their rights to have certain guns. No, they're not going to lose their rights, but it may be harder. Although Steve, the legislature is not going to be convened. There's not going to be a legislative session. No, there's not. A special you, session. If you're concerned about Second Amendment protections, you have nothing to worry about in the state of Florida. I mean, the Democrats are going to continue calling for a special session. They've been accused of basically posturing. Sure, it's posturing, but it's a smart political move for the Democrats in a very important election year to say we need to refocus yeah. the debate on gun control. My gosh, even yeah. Donald Trump tweeted this week that he was going to meet with the NRA and he would consider a couple of changes. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I thought that was pretty significant. No, nobody wants to have terrorists have guns. I think that's a of point course. that everybody agrees. Well, How do you keep guns off terrorists? All right. Well, in not. terms of who should have guns, here's a soundbite from yesterday. Donald Trump talking about what the answer might have been. No, we don't have it. Well, what he said essentially was, uh, what if people inside that club, somebody, a number of people had had guns uh, and they had opened fire on this guy. Of course, there was a sworn police officer in the club who exchanged gunfire who exchanged with him. Gunfire and again, the, poli the police, 11 police officers showed up 15 minutes later and they didn't go in the club. But I, I have to say, I generally think it's a bad idea to mix alcohol and firearms. And, and the state's current yeah. ban on having someone have a weapon in a bar is a bad idea. But I also must confess that that idea crossed my mind when you look at the timeline, you find out people were hiding in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. However, this guy also apparently had body armor on. So it might not have made a difference yeah. anyway. I, yeah. do, I do think we're going to have a debate about these issues all over again. Keep, it, keep in mind some of the gun control or gun-related bills that don't pass in Tallahassee, sponsored by Republicans. That is open carry, campus carry, letting teachers carry guns in a classroom. I mean, yeah. look, members are serious about We're going to have that debate all over because again the discussion, on both sides. Because the discussion is that a lot of these crimes happen precisely in gun-free areas or zones where... Nobody's carrying a gun. If you go to a place where a lot of people have guns, you don't see this happen. Is there a political tipping point at some point? I mean, everyone thought Sandy Hook might be that, and it, and it was not. Is there a political tipping point where people, and the majority of people, and especially in what's called the gunshine state, and I'm not quite sure that's fair either, but is there a point where the public opinion forces a change? So far, no. I think I was on the show after Sandy Hook, and I said, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we just have too many guns in this country. We, and not unfortunately, but we yeah. do have a Second Amendment. The reality is, is more of these shootings are going to happen. Well, and they did, and let's, they do, and Let's they will. point out for anybody who is uh, not, uh, doesn't know that tomorrow in Washington, in the U.S. Senate, Senator uh, Collins of Maine has got a bill that has a chance of passing that would make some, the first time in 40 years that they would change some laws regarding guns and the people who have been on the no-fly, no-buy list, uh, they'd still have due process and be able to buy the guns, but once they bought the guns, then the FBI would put them under surveillance. So it's not going to pass the House, so I doubt it's going to pass. Okay. Final word? Mark Final Caputo. word. Thank you very much, Marilee. Mary, sorry. Steve. Steve. <laughs> no, it, hey, it thanks is for, what it is. Thanks for being with us. All right. Thank next day, shelter for young people from Central America crossing the border. It's now up and running in Homestead. First teams were taken there this week, and we will take you there. Glenna will take you there next. We're all along for the ride.
This week, the first group of teenage migrants from Central America began arriving at a new temporary shelter in Homestead. They are some of the children crossing the border alone, escaping danger and poverty. Their numbers are up, and the South Florida shelter now in operation is large enough to accommodate 800 of them. Anything that's fenced off. Beyond the guarded fences, dozens of contract workers care for and counsel children arriving without families from an unimaginable trek across borders from Central American countries through Mexico. Some will come traumatized, possibly physically and or sexually abused. They are escaping gang threats and violence born of extreme poverty, as Local 10 has documented. Legally, they're called unaccompanied alien children. There is room here for up to 800. Most will be 13 to 17 years old. Most from Honduras, Guatemala and El Salvador. In the summer of 2014 there was a big scramble to to try to figure out how to make sure that we had a, a safe place for them and that they could be treated fairly and have their cases reviewed. And Congresswoman Ileana Ross Layton, who represents the district where the 10th city has risen, wrote, it is difficult to know if the numbers will continue to increase, but I believe we must be prepared with the necessary resources to assist these vulnerable children. The children will live, eat and play here, schooling and medical care all on site. They will have no contact with the outside South Florida community. The shelter and its operations are funded federally by a budget earmarked specifically for unaccompanied minor children crossing the borders. And on Tuesday, there will be uh, there will be something there to get a first look. We will be there to get a first look inside the operation. They're calling it a media tour. All right. Next, was it a hate crime or terrorism or both? That is only half the question. Stay with us. Good afternoon and happy Father's Day. A live look out of Fort Lauderdale's Tower Cam. You can see there is some sunshine finally returning and breaking through the clouds, but temperatures aren't as hot as there. We're getting into the mid 80s, at least in Miami already at 85. Winds out of the north and northwest picking up just a bit, tracking a few showers that are uh, starting to head into West Palm Beach coastline. Those will be impacting Broward first and then eventually Miami Dade County through the rest of the afternoon. Highs today 89. Tomorrow's rain chances go down. Jennifer, thanks. Before we leave you this, this week, a few notes from the road. We had a big crew in Central Florida covering what would turn out to be the worst mass shooting in American history right in our backyard. My piece of the puzzle was figuring out the gunman, who, why, what were the signs someone had to have missed. And there was a lot there to unearth. We went through scores of pages of school and work records, public documents that tracked his actions and transactions. We talked to people who knew him. Was it terrorism? Was it a hate crime? Was it both? What did he hate? Western civilization? His life was almost perfectly American, for better and worse. Hate people who are not like him or people who were like him hate himself? The truth is, we may never know. We now have plenty of evidence of a life of confusing contradictions, a quest for power and attention, a seemingly bitter and angry outbursts. In hindsight, it's clear this man should never have had weapons, the license to buy them, or jobs securing facilities and people. His disdain for authority and rebellious violent nature is documented so well in school records as far back as third grade and in his dealings with co-workers and in his relationships. He said and did things and had connections that raised flags. The FBI investigated him twice, yet still, there he was. Over the last week, I spent considerable time with Mateen's father, asking him to help us understand how Omar, who was devoted to a young son of his own, could slaughter the sons and daughters of so many other families, and he had no direct answers. And so while the country debates how to protect gun rights and at the same time protect lives and public safety, the truth is we have no answers here, no answers anywhere really at this point. And that, along with an obvious absence of protocols to identify people like Omar Mateen, that is the most frightening part. So what do you think? We invite you to weigh in on any topic you like. And we will respond if you talk to us. Remember, stay informed, get involved, and happy Father's Day.